started. Welcome back everyone from our two week hiatus, although it may not have been much of a hiatus for some people and appreciate everyone's um, fortitude and strength in this very um, unusual time. So to start off the new year though, we have, um, we have an external speaker who um, we're all really excited about and he has a lot of connections to various people. And I think this talk is gonna be really, um, really interesting. So I will just uh, get started here. So Dr. Todd Fo'o is an assistant professor in the division of general internal medicine at Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Medicine. In addition to his medical degree, he has a background in computer science and statistics. Dr. Fo'o's research centers on improving the individual and population level health of persons with HIV and mental health comorbidities using innovative statistical and machine learning algorithms. Some of his specific projects include developing population level models to forecast HIV epidemics under a range of potential interventions and making personalized predictions about psychiatric disease and HIV control. Uh, he is also a Scenix investigator and, and it, thank you to Dr. Kachai. This is how we have Dr. Fo'o today. Um, so with that, I will uh, pass it along to you. Um, I'm gonna say Todd, if that's okay for the rest of the talk. We are not a particularly formal group. Um, and yeah, we're, we're looking forward to hearing you talk. Well, thank you so much. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm excited to, to talk to you today about some of the modeling work we've been doing. Um, so this is my plan. I'll go briefly over the ending the HIV epidemic initiative. I know we're all familiar, but it's sort of the motivation for this work. And then I will present to you a mathematical model that we've used to sort of forecast what it would take to reach the EHE goals. We'll go over the structure, the parameters, and you know, I like math. I get excited to talk about math at 8 a.m. in the morning. I recognize not everyone shares that characteristic, so I promise I'll go light on the math and just give you enough to, to sort of convince you that you can, that you can trust us. And um, then we'll talk over some of the results for the EHE goals. And at the end, I'll share a little bit about modeling work we've done about the potential impact that the um, COVID-19 pandemic might have on HIV transmission. I think that's pretty interesting. That's obviously something we're all thinking about constantly. Um, and then go over concluding thoughts. Um, so the ending the HIV epidemic initiative seeks to reduce HIV infections by 90% over 10 years by 2030, right? And um, when they announced the initiative, they identified 50 high burden counties in seven states with a high burden of uh, rural HIV. Um, and I remember listening to a talk by Dr. Fauci sort of laying out this initiative and him presenting that we think we can do this with sort of existing technology care methods. Um, but basically they said, we think we can do this by diagnosing people with HIV rapidly, treating people with diagnosed HIV so that they get suppressed and can't transmit their infection, and then using preventative um, therapies, primarily PrEP, and also responding quickly to clusters. And as I was listening to this talk, right, it occurred to me that that these these this really presents a very testable hypothesis for someone who does modeling, right? Particularly those first three pillars. And so the question that we thought out the answer was, you know, uh, to say, well, okay, you say you want to uh, reduce incidence by 90%. You say we're going to do it by diagnosing, treating, preventing, right? Um, to what extent do you need to do those things to reach your stated goal, right? So how frequently do you need to test people um, for HIV? What proportion of people who have HIV and are diagnosed do you need to get suppressed? And then how much PrEP do you need to deploy across at rate? groups, right? Um, and we thought we would do this, you know, for the population in general, and then looking at specific high-risk subgroups, right? Can you get there by really focusing on, on the highest risk subgroups? Um, just a word here, when we talk about PrEP, um, the way we've represented in our model is both, um, you know, Truvada or another medication that reduces the risk of getting HIV, but also um, regular follow-up with testing every three to six months, right? And so our primary outcome for, for this work is the reduction in incident infections over 10 years from 2020 to 2030, right? 
And the model that we use is something called a compartmental model that represents the population as different chunks um, of people, right? So different chunks by age, by race, by risk factors. But the assumption then is that within each compartment, within each subgrouping, everybody behaves the same. So really what we are modeling is the average behavior of individuals within each strata. And we describe sort of rates at which people move between compartments um, and use that to forecast HIV uh, into the future. And the last thing to mention is that we do model sort of a closed system, right? So whatever geographic area we model, we're making the assumption that basically all infections arise from contacts within that geographic population. So no imported infections, right? And so the basic compartments um, that we use for our models, there's one compartment for HIV negative and people who are HIV negative, some proportion of them can be enrolled in PrEP a PrEP program. Um, if they become infected, they move to undiagnosed acute HIV compartments, either not in PrEP programs or they might still be in a PrEP program, but not yet aware that they are um, HIV infected. And as they become diagnosed, they move to a diagnosed compartment, right? And people in that compartment, there's some proportion of them who are virally suppressed and some proportion who are unsuppressed. And then that's all for acute HIV, the first about three months, when we think viral loads are higher, risks of transmission are greater. And then with time, um, people with HIV infection will move into chronic HIV um, compartments. So that's the basic structure, right? And in terms of the interventions that we're looking at, right, for testing, if we sort of affect the rates at which people move from these undiagnosed compartments to diagnosed compartments, we can test different frequencies of testing, right? The impact of different frequencies of testing. To look at suppression, right? If we want to change the amount of people who are virally suppressed, you can drag this sort of proportion of suppression. And then to look at that PrEP pillar, right? You can drag the proportion of people in the HIV negative compartment um, back and forth, right? So this is the basic structure, but, but, but the, the bigger model actually has a lot more compartments, right? Because we take these compartments and we split them up by um, different IV injection drug use um, status, right? So either never use, active use, or prior use. And then by sex, which is sex at birth primarily plus sexual behaviors, right? And we don't explicitly represent um, transgender individuals here because we set our model up to sort of recapitulate CDC reporting. And this is how they report it, right? And so when they're reporting the bulk of transgender women at least would be classified as MSM. Um, right? And then this model, right? These states are actually then further subdivided up um, by age, five age strata, and then uh, race is black, Hispanic, or other race. And so that all told gives us 945 compartments in the model. So it's a big model, a lot of compartments going on. And the last thing I want to mention is that, so the CDC's or the EHE's um, counties, priority urban counties are all, are all counties, but we actually structure our model to be at the level of metropolitan statistical areas, which are slightly wider. And actually for San Diego, the metropolitan statistical area is just the county of San Diego. But for most other counties, uh, or for most other metropolitan statistical areas, you have the county, right? So for example, for San Francisco, the high burden county is San Francisco itself, but the metropolitan statistical area includes San Francisco and then the four surrounding counties, right? And the primary reason we do that is again, this model is, is doing a closed system assumption, right? So we're assuming that any infections we capture happen within the model, right? And, and that gets to be a harder assumption if you're saying just the county, right? So like one of the high burden counties is um, Fort Lauderdale, right? And so it would be hard for me to justify making a model that says all infections in Fort Lauderdale come from Fort Lauderdale and none at all from nearby Miami, for example, right? Um, so anyways, if you take those 48 high burden counties that are actually in the continental US or in the, in the US and um, include Washington DC, they reduce down to 32 metropolitan statistical areas because some like Miami and Fort Lauderdale will fall into one MSA. And so that is where we did our model. Todd, I think there is a timely question from uh, Susan Little that I wanted to share related to this because, and you may end up talking about San Diego, I think, but um, could you add a compartment for migration in and out of the region uh, for border populations like San Diego? There's a lot of cross-border travel, migration. Um, so, so I feel like you just sort of were talking about that and, and maybe you could explain how, how you would consider that. Yeah, so, so I mean, we don't, right? We certainly could, you know, the, the limiting factor, right? You can, you can always do things with models, right? The question is whether you should, right? And the limiting factor has been sort of data, right? Um, and so, I mean, it'd be interesting. I am obviously 
I'm very familiar with Baltimore, less familiar with San Diego. So I, I would perhaps it's something we could talk about more, right? But but basically, if you told me we want to do this, I'd say, okay, well, we need to have good senses of how many people are moving, where they're moving from, sort of what HIV prevalences are, you know, among the people who are moving, right? And so, so that can be done sort of in a one-off way, but but we at least for this work tried to sort of do the same thing for everywhere. So so we've not done that, but but we could, right? And to the degree that you think it's an important source of HIV, right? Then our model is going to to miss those sorts of flows. And then uh, Nettie Aldis just said the other consideration would be to combine San Diego and Tijuana, which is our big area, and consider that sort of a you know a, a one area. So that yeah, right. that could be another actually, way to think about it. I mean, one thing I would like to do eventually is get to sort of bigger state level models that would link up different places, right? And so that's sort of a future direction, right? Including the catchment area bigger. All these things have costs, right? Costs in the data that you need, and costs in the complexity and the processing time. So, anyways. Um, that's the limitation sort of, of the work that we did now. Um, for, for the model, right? So again, there's a lot of compartments and what we need are sort of parameters to make all these transitions run, right? And so I won't go through everything, but just to give an example, just sort of this transition moving from um, uninfected to infected with HIV, right? We'll need model parameters for sexual transmission, sort of getting a sense of rate of transmission per partnership, breakdown of partners by age, race, sex, risk factors. Um, for each of the partnering strata, we need estimates, parameters that govern sort of how many people are virally suppressed in the partnering strata. We need variations over time. We're gonna need similar parameters for needle sharing transmission, right? And then we're gonna need these parameters for each different stratum of age, race, sex, uh, risk factor, right? So, so the number of parameters you need gets, gets quite large here, right? Um, and this is sort of where we've drawn a lot of these parameters from, right? So population stuff from US Census and CDC, and then different specific um, HIV, injection drug use, sexual transmission parameters from the published literature. I don't wanna go through it in super detail, but what I do wanna point out is that we sort of think of parameters in two buckets, right? We have some parameters that we take just as sort of gospel truth. Um, so, you know, we did this for, for population sizes from the census and we say, okay, well, you know, what's reported, that's what it is. But we also have some parameters that we calibrate. And what that means is that we take sort of a best guess from the published literature, but, you know, for example, um, you know, the, the literature that we used on sort of different pairings um, by injection drug use, that comes from a study in Baltimore, right? And that may not be, what is going on in, in San Diego, right, or, or other places. And so what we do is we use a, a complicated, that I get very excited about, probabilistic process, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. But we basically say, okay, well, this is the best guess on published literature, but we're going to find the parameters that work best for the particular setting that we're modeling, right? And so, so the idea behind the calibration process is that for each city, um, we want to find which parameters of all these parameters we need governing sexual transmission, injection, drug use, um, suppression in different strata, testing rates. We want to find sort of the parameters that most closely reproduce what we've seen in the recent past, over the past 10 years in each city. And then we kind of project it forward, right? And rather than just saying, well, okay, this is the one parameter we think, we use a probabilistic process that runs thousands of simulations and comes up with a whole range of possible values for each of these parameters, right? So to give you a sense, um, this figure here is sort of showing what we're working with. The dots here are the reported diagnoses um, in San Diego um, over the past 10 years, right? And you can imagine, right, I might pick some set of parameters that gives me this simulation um, in an orange line. We might say, okay, that's not too bad, right? We're sort of capturing these things. Um, I could give you another simulation maybe that goes like this, right, blue, and we'd say, well, that's not really a very good fitting simulation, right? So what we want our calibration process to do is sort of identify parameters that give the simulations like this and, and not really ones that work like this. And the way we do that is we define a function called a likelihood that fundamentally says, how likely is a simulation given the data that we're trying to fit to? Right? And then you can use it to compare different simulations and maybe you'd say something like, well, this simulation here is a hundred times or a thousand times more likely than this simulation. And we do that not only for new diagnoses, but for 10 different calibration uh, targets, right? So we do that for reported diagnoses, for the CDC estimated prevalence, for mortality, for the proportion of people who are aware of their serostatus, the proportion who are virally suppressed, 
um, people who are receiving a script for um, Truvada is reported by age, age view, the probability of receiving HIV test, um, IV drug use parameters, and some historical data to sort of get the early pandemic or epidemic right. And we feed this all into a calibration process. It's called an adaptive metropolis sampler. Again, I get very excited about this. I recognize maybe not everybody else does, but fundamentally what it's doing is we sort of randomly pick a set of parameters. We use it to run a simulation. We pick a slightly different set of parameter values. We run it and then we see which is better, right? And then we do this hundreds of thousands of times. We actually run 400,000 simulations for each city, exploring all the different combinations of parameters. And at the end, what we get is about a thousand simulations that, that fit the city well. Right. So the end point of this is to give us a set of simulations um, that fits it well, but also captures that uncertainty that we don't know exactly the values of all the parameters for governing HIV transmission. And what that'll give us is something like this. Right. So again, here are the same um, calibration targets, but now each of these lines here represents the simulation. And I've shown you 100 here. Again, we use 1,000, but it gets all messy if you, if you actually show 1,000 different simulations. Right. And so this is the calibration that we've done to San Diego, right? We've done that for reported cases, for prevalence, for proportion virally suppressed, for the knowledge of status, but we're actually doing it at a more stratified level than that, right? So if you take this reported cases, we fit them, not just the total reported, but by risk factors, right? So this is MSM, heterosexuals, um, people who use IV drugs, um, by race, by sex, by age, and we're actually even calibrating to a more finely stratified level than that, right? If you take these risk factor ones, we break them out and are fitting to combi combinations of um, risk factor and race, risk factor um, and age, which I'm not showing you here, risk factor and sex, and we're doing that for reported diagnoses, for prevalence, for suppression levels, right? So it's hitting a lot of targets at a, at a finely stratified level, right? And once we've got the model calibrated or fit, what we can do is take those trends and project them out for the next 10 years, right? And so I'm showing you here reported diagnosis, which is what we fit to, and then underlying right? And we project this out for 10 years to say, okay, well, this is what's gonna happen. And if I sort of draw the line here at 2020, so that's the average number of cases in 2020, and the average number of cases in 2030, I can calculate the reduction, right? And so, so this model is projecting that if we project forward in the future and just sort of keep doing things as we're doing them, making marginal gains in suppression, marginal gains in testing, marginal increase in PrEP use, um, we expect that San Diego is gonna see a 35% reduction in incidence over this decade, right? But now what we can start to do is, is tweak those parameters, right? So here's an intervention that we model. We say, well, for that, highest risk sort of subgroup, Black and Hispanic, MSM, and MSM who inject drugs, um, less than 35 years old. What if we tested them on average once a year, got 80% of those with HIV virally suppressed, and got 10% of those at risk um, in that group um, on, in a PrEP program, right? Um, that then gives you a slightly right here in the blue simulations, they overlap a lot, but they're getting a little lower, 44% um, reduction instead of 35%, right? I could give you another more intensive intervention, right? So we've broadened out here to all MSM and all people who inject drugs, sort of all ages, all races, and we're gonna do a much more intensive intervention on this group, right? So we're going to test them on average twice a year, get 90% virally suppressed, and get a quarter of people who, who are eligible on PrEP, right? So this gives you a much bigger reduction, 85%. Uh, over the 10 years, you see this sort of spike here as that increased testing hits, and you diagnose cases, cases that then sort of fall. So these are the sort of interventions now that, that we're gonna be looking to say, what's it gonna take to reach EHG goals? All right, and here's a big table, um, and I'll zoom in, but this is just to show you, we did all 32 cities. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here and give you sort of the top 10 by incidence in 28, by reported diagnosis in 2018, and then San Diego, which falls a little lower down, right? So again, this is that no intervention column, right? And then you can see that's 35% reduction. Um, well, I think I have a rounding error because it was 34. Um, it's like 35 and a half. Um, and then here, 45% reduction for that one that focuses on just young black and Hispanic MSM. And then that's that 85% reduction for, um, for all MSM and all people who inject drugs. To orient you, right, because there's a lot of numbers, we've sort of color-coded them. And so red would be, you didn't change incidence at all. Um, as you sort of increase your incidence reduction, it gets more and more yellow. And then if you cross over the 90% threshold, the cells will be shaded green, okay? So I'm gonna show you a few more of these tables, but this is sort of 
how they work. Um, so one thing we did, the first thing we did is we said, okay, well, what if we just, and again, here's that no intervention column, what if we just focused on testing, right? We get people tested twice a year um, for MSM, people inject drugs, and once a year for heterosexuals, right? What does that give you? Um, so sort of pretty intensive, aggressive level of testing, right? We give you here in San Diego, a two thirds reduction in incidence. Um, that's better across the board. You get a 55% reduction in incidence. Um, you know, here's another intervention. What if you give everybody who's PrEP eligible, put a quarter of them on PrEP, right? What would that give you? About a 60% drop over 10 years in San Diego, um, you know, in the 40s to 50s for a lot of other places. And what if we got 90% of all people with HIV suppressed? Um, okay, well, that would give us here 59% about the same as for everyone, right? We also, so, so basically the point here is if you do really aggressive intervention on just one of those things, you can get decent reductions, but you're not gonna get to 90%, right? We also said, well, what if we did, um, instead of really intensive, we just improved everything a little bit. So, so we called this sort of marginal improvement scenario. And we said, for each group, we're gonna test them one and a quarter times as often as they would have otherwise been tested, get 5% more of them on PrEP, in 10% more virally suppressed, you know, what does that give you? That gives you also then something in the range here of doing a very intensive intervention, focusing on just one of these things. Hey, Todd, yep. can I interrupt for one sec? Yep. This is uh, Susan Little. So can Please. I just clarify? So I'm, I'm just a bit surprised. So to clarify, for the suppression, you're saying that if you took everyone living with HIV and got 90% of them virally suppressed, you would get a 60, I don't know, pick San Diego, 59% um, uh, improvement as compared, is that what you're saying? It is 90% of all people with diagnosed HIV who are right. aware of their serostatus. status. Um, okay, so I, I'm, I'm surprised. And that, because that's then less good than simply testing um, yeah, right. And in fact, that's not a pattern that we see in most cities, right? And, and more that's resting on basically a sort of estimates on the proportion who are aware of their share status, right? And I mean, again, there is baked in sort of rates of transmission, right? So fundamentally, what that's saying is, right, is how much of transmission is happening by people who are aware and unsuppressed versus how much is happening by people who are not yet aware of their Okay, so the implication would be that there are many more people here that are infected and unaware. Right, then in say other places, right? And again, that's sort Got of it. resting on, um, you know, CDC estimates of, of those which, you know, have their uncertainty that go with them. But yes. Okay. And Thanks. also I should say too, it's not just that. We also, we plugged into the other the other data source we use that is um, BRFIS, uh, which I always forget what that acronym stands for, basically asks in each city sort of, have you been tested for HIV? And so sort of we've, we've sort of plugged those into the model too, right? So so that's sort of where testing is coming from is those two data sources. But But yes, fundamentally, that is what this is saying. Great, thank you. All right, um, so then we we sort of said, all right, let's test a bunch of different in interventions, sort of scaling up the risk groups that we target, and then the intensity of the intervention, see what would it take to get to the neighborhood of 90%, right? And so broadly speaking, this first set of four interventions here is just um, targeting young Black and Hispanic MSM. Right. This next set of four interventions here, this is broadened out to all MSM and all people who inject drugs. And then this last set of interventions basically hits everybody in the population. Right. And again, that first intervention I showed you, sort of testing once a year, 10% PrEP use, 80% viral suppression, that um, is this column here. Right. That second one that, that we showed for San Diego, twice a year, 25% PrEP uh, coverage and 90% viral suppression among people with diagnosed HIV that's here, right? And again, without going into the specifics of all these different numbers, the, the big takeaway is that there's not a whole lot of green here, right? So it's pretty hard to get to a 90% reduction. And these are, you know, I don't want to understate this, right? These are uh, heroic levels of, of doing things, right? You know, we sort of escalated to see what would it take to get there, right? But testing every, you know, people on average twice a year, that's a lot, right? Getting a quarter of people on PrEP, you know, that's a lot that's more than it's done sort of across the population in, in any city, right? 90% of people virally suppressed, right? That would correspond to, you know, the UNA is 95, 95, 95, right? If you take 95% of people um, with diagnosed HIV and get them on, on ART and 95% of those virally suppressed, that works out to about 90%, right? But that is also an aspirational goal, right? 
Um, so, so the downside here is not a lot of, it's hard to get to 90% production, right? The upside is for sort of less intensive things, right? Just targeting high risk groups, um, you can get decent reductions, right? I mean, there's nothing shabby about 50, 60% reductions, um, but it's hard to get to 90. Um, and then we have also, right? I mean, that's a lot of numbers. What we did is we, we did this web tool. Uh, um, so sort of for every city you can go and you can generate graphs for all the things that we tested, all the interventions we tested. And there's actually a way that you can design your own custom interventions sort of for any level of prep, any level of testing, any level of viral suppression that you want and project it into the future. And we put that online and I would be pleased for you to do it. I apologize, sometimes it glitches. And this is owing to the fact that my calling in life is not to be a web developer, as I've discovered. Um, but, you know, uh, we put it on there because because we know that that table is a whole ton of stuff and, and there's only so many things that you can cram into a table and a paper. Um, but there you can do sort of anything. Todd, can uh, yep. this is Daniel. Can you go back one slide? Um, I think there was a question from Nettie Aldis uh, asking about uh, all heterosexuals. Does that really mean just heterosexuals or does it mean all people? Uh, because, for example, there's no all MSM group shown. Oh, sorry. So, so this one, basically, these two between these two groups, you have all MSM, right? So, this is the young black and Hispanic MSM, and then this is all the other MSM who don't fall into that category, right? So, so this thing here is saying for heterosexuals, or people who are at least classified, shall we say, by CDC criteria as heterosexual being their their respecter, um, you would have let's say in this column here, testing on average once a year, 25% suppressed, 25% uh, on PrEP, and then 90% suppression in people with HIV versus for MSM, right? It's testing on average twice a year, 25% um, PrEP coverage, and then 90% uh, suppression. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, conclusions, right? When I set out for this work, I was like, great, we're gonna fit a model to every city and we're gonna say, okay, for each city, you know, do this, this, and this, and this is how you get to 90%, right? And then obviously that, that didn't work out, right? So it's hard to get to 90%, right? And again, anyway, we're approaching that you need to do interventions that target a lot of people and are very intensive, right? So a big, big lift. Um, maybe the, the positive spin is though, you can get pretty good reductions um, by focusing on high-risk subgroups. Um, not a little bit in the 90, but decent reductions, even in the 60s, 70s, right? And you can also get pretty good reductions by doing, improving everything a little bit for everybody. Um, and then there's a lot of local of variation, right? You know, as you were saying, right? In a lot of places, testing is not as efficacious as um, getting more people virally suppressed, right? And that sort of reflects the local balance of how well you're doing, right? You, you sort of get this paradoxical thing too, right? That the better, let's say the continuum is in a city at baseline, the less improvement you can get by cranking up suppression, right? Some places that have a lot of viral suppression are doing a good job in getting people with diagnosed HIV virally suppressed, there is less juice that you can get out of that, out of that squeeze, right? Than in other places. So um, all right. So I'll spend a few minutes just to talk about um, some work we've done on forecasting um, what's going on with the COVID pandemic, because I get a lot of questions about what is COVID going to do to HIV, right? And spoiler alert, the answer is still we don't know. Um, but the way that we got the way that we that we got at this was we let the pandemic affect four parameters or sexual transmission rates, rates of viral suppression, rates of testing, and rates of prep use, right? And we explored a whole range of what the pandemic might do to these things. There's some preliminary literature, right? And it sort of spans the gamut. And obviously this is time changing. So, so what we did is we said, okay, well, let's test a whole bunch of different simulations. And in each simulation, we're gonna say, um, you know, pick a number between zero and 50% that sexual transmission is decreased and pick a number between zero and 40% that viral suppression is decreased at that outset of the pandemic, right? And what we did to sort of get at the time varying nature is we said, okay, well, let's say you reduce 25% at the outset of the pandemic, we're gonna index that to Google mobility data, right? So Google's published this mobility data for five sort of different things. And this is the data from San Diego. So for traffic to workplaces, you know, early on in the pandemic, you see this drop and then you kind of see an increase, but we never get back to sort of the baseline change, right? For groceries, for pharmacies, right? All these are decreased and then more spending more time at home. And what we did is we took these five different measures and we synthesized them into one, basically saying, okay, well, if we call, you know, the maximal change here, what happened in March to April, right? And then every time, what is the 
percentage of that maximal change and then average out across all five. So you sort of get this synthesis of the average change um, from, from baseline in across all these five categories of mobility, right? And you see this pattern sort of across the cities, this big jump, big change, obviously in March, April of 2020, then you fall off, you get to the winter again with that surge and it climbs again and then kind of comes back down. And the way that we indexed parameters to that, let's say that we said, well, we're going to say that there was a 25% reduction here at the onset of the pandemic. Then we index it to data and say, okay, it sort of goes back to normal. For the simulations I'm going to show you, we played with different timelines, but we said drop initially March to April and then begin to normalize March 8th, which we picked as sort of the date when the CDC had said, you know, vaccinated people can start behaving normally again, which obviously has since been rolled back. Um, and say sexual transmission gets all the way back to normal by July 4th of uh, last year now, 2021. Um, for the other ones, for viral suppression and also for testing prep use, we, we allowed the effects of the pandemic to linger a little longer, right? So again, you get that initial drop, um, tracks with mobility data, but then begins to normalize not until September. And now we're sort of all laughing, right? Because this was all modeled. We, we set these timeframes before Omicron, and even before a lot of the Delta surge. So we said, okay, let's say we get back to normal here in terms of the pandemic's effect on transmission parameters um, by January this past week. So, um, you know, I think take that, take that as a, a limitation, uh, but there's also a web tool for this if you, if you wanna go play with different timelines. Um, but anyways, that's, that's sort of what we did. And the last thing I'll tell you we did is we actually said, well, we don't know really how closely um, mobility data tracks with different sort of HIV related behaviors. And so we're gonna vary that, right? So we had some simulation where we said, look, it has no effect on behavior. Mobility is not at all related to behavior. So you sort of have a drop and then you're fixed. And then you had ones where we said, look, it's really tied right now. This change is corresponding almost exactly to the changes in mobility over time. And then we sampled all the sort of ranges in between, right? And that's sort of in that Bayesian calibration framework. When we don't know something, we just try a whole bunch of different things, right? We, we vary a whole bunch of different variables. So, so that's the sort of range of effects that we sampled. And overall, these are the Right, where I've taken those lines and I've just summarized them into the mean and the 95% confidence interval, right? And so again, here in um, orangish, we have what would have happened if the pandemic had never happened, and then what do we think might happen with the pandemic, right? And so you get this initial drop here, followed by a, a climb in incidence, and then kind of returning back to where you were, right? But there's a whole wide range of what might happen. Um, and so, so what ends up, oh, I should say too, right? So we say here, if, if there was no COVID, we would have expected 1,300 incident infections um, over the next five years. With COVID, on average, you have 211 more cases, ranging from anywhere from 35 fewer to 400 more um, cases or incident infections due to the COVID-19 pandemic, right? But there's a whole wide range of uncertainty here, right? And it sort of depends on what is going on with with the parameters. And the two most influential ones are what do you think is happening to sexual transmission and what do you think is happening to viral suppression? So, so here is the 200 simulations where you had a big reduction in sexual transmission at the outset and kind of returned to normal over the subsequent year and relatively small impact on the continuum of care of viral suppression, right? Which is here as you see a drop in cases. So in this sort of world where you think, um, you know, the pandemic really decreased sexual transmission behaviors, but, but didn't affect the continue much, right? COVID was good for HIV. You had fewer infections, right? Um, and then we have sort of this world here where we said there's a relatively small reduction in sexual transmission, but a, but a pretty large disruption of the continuum of care, right? And a reduction of up to 40% viral suppression, right? And here, you know, COVID is bad for HIV in this world, right? You just get a plain old uptake in incidence. Um, but what is also interesting and maybe worrying, right, is that in both of these, though, you see an initial drop, right? And it's not really until 2021, 2022, that the reported cases start to tell you which of these two worlds you're in, right? Um, because if the pandemic has some disruption to testing and, and sort of regular care, we're going to be storing up a reservoir of cases that we normally would have diagnosed that, that we haven't diagnosed, right? Um, and so... So fundamentally, right, it's hard to say still what will happen. Um, you could sort of look to other data, and at some point we'd like to do this more rigorously, right? You could say what has happened to sort of other symptomatic STDs like gonorrhea, primary, secondary syphilis, harder to defer testing on those, right? And they haven't dropped a whole lot, 
Um, right. So, you know, anecdotally, my impression is that we're, we're, oh, my mouse went away. My anecdotally, my impression is that we're probably more in this world here. Um, but I, I guess the jury is still out, right? And, you know, it's also really hard to know what happened with suppression, right? So a lot of places aren't reporting a big change in suppression, but what there was was a huge drop in the number of um, HIV PCRs that were done, right? And so what you think happened to suppression depends on what you think happened to that other group of people, right? Is it that they are staying suppressed just like the other would have otherwise would have been, and they just didn't come in for testing, you know, because everyone was trying to stay away, right? And so, so we really have about the same amount of suppression, or is it that those are people who are lost to care They've lost their suppression, right? It's hard to know. Um, so, you know, conclusions here, right? The effects of what the pandemic is going to do to HIV transmission really depends a lot on um, how, how big and how long the disruptions are to the continuum of care, right? Versus the disruptions to sexual transmission. And also sort of, do you think that, you know, sexual transmission was disrupted, but then got back to normal pretty quickly, whereas disruptions to care went on longer, which again, anecdotally, would be my suspicion, but but I don't have hard data to, to su support that, right? You know, th then this is gonna be not a good thing, right? Versus if you think vice versa, then then it may not be a big deal for HIV transmission, right? And the other the other thing that shakes out of this work is that your traditional sort of HIV reporting metrics are not gonna give you a great picture here in you know the, the few years immediately around the pandemic, right? So so we're gonna to have to think about other sort of data that might tell us about what's going on. Um, so, so sort of overall thoughts, limitation of this work, right? Um, this model is a compartmental model, right? And fundamentally we are saying that people within a compartment behave sort of in the same way we're modeling the average behavior. Obviously that's not true, right? Um, and so, you know, you can't represent detailed sexual needle sharing networks, right? For testing and prep, we assume sort of that they're evenly distributed across the compartment. But some people, you know, within a group of age, sex, risk factor, all that will have higher risk than others, right? And it might be that, you know, PrEP is easier to give to those people who are higher risk. And then, you know, PrEP will do better than what we project here. Or, or you might think that, well, actually, those people who are highest risk are the hardest to reach in delivering PrEP. And then what we say PrEP is going to do is actually an, under, an overestimate of, of what it would do. Um, we don't have compartments for transgender individuals. Um, and I am, if people are interested, I'm happy to talk about that more. Is something I think about a lot, but but the the fundamental limitation is that there is not great recording data on transgender individuals, right? And so so we could do it, but we'd be sort of just saying, you know, what gives me confidence in a lot of these other projections is the calibration, right? And I know that I'm tracking what's happening with MSM. I know that I'm tracking what's happening with you know heterosexuals, right? If you don't have that data, it's sort of saying, well, you know, we think this is what's going on, but, but we don't have any way to check. And so that that as a modeler makes me uncomfortable. Um, and then the other thing is that in this work, the continuum of care has collapsed. Um, so we basically are not modeling the individual steps. We're just saying either you're suppressed or you're not. Um, strength, right? We, we represent the epidemic with a whole bunch of different compartments or granular representation of different races and, and ages. Um, we think it's a good thing that we've, we've modeled at the level of metropolitan statistical areas, right? Because you see a lot of variation from place to place, right? And you see that sort of when we compare to national models, you know, if we sort of average all our 32 places together, we kind of come out in line with what national models have shown, but you get big swings, right? And some cities do much better than others. Um, and then we have sort of this rigorous calibration process. So we've used a whole ton of simulations to explore different things that might be leading to the epidemic that we see. And it's also semi-automated. I got a request a few months ago to add St. Louis. And so we ran it and it takes about three to four weeks to add a new city. Um, so. Uh, future directions, we're looking to expand out the HIV continuum of care so we could test specific steps. Um, at some point, I'd like to more rigorously factor in other epidemiological data to sort of say, well, this is what we actually think is happening to sexual transmission or suppression um, for, for COVID. Um, we're looking to do cost levels. I, I'm very interested in doing sort of state level models um, and sort of broader areas as we sort of alluded to. And, you know, sort of probably on the back burner at this point is compartments for transgender individuals, which I'd like to do. And you know, some places at least have started reporting data. I've seen like for LA, I think, and I don't recall for San Diego, but some places have started breaking out that data for the past few years. It's definitely not available at a systematic level, but um, that's sort of on the radar screen. And with that, I'll say thank you. And thank you to all my collaborators um, and to our funders. I'm happy for any questions. Todd, thank you so much. 
Um, oh, we have a couple of questions. There was one question in the or comment question in the chat uh, from Susan, but I think you just addressed it by saying that costing cost is something that you'll be looking at. I don't know if there's anything else, Susan, you wanted to add, or Todd, you want to respond to that question, um, a cost analysis to see which approach would be the most cost effective. Yeah, I mean, it, it is something that we are looking to doing, and you know, sort of the first step is getting things up and running, and then. We will okay. like layer costing on. All right. The first hand up I see is uh, Dr. Borquez and Anak, if you want to um, speak. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Todd. That was impressive. That's such a huge amount of work. I am very impressed. Um, I had a few questions. My first one is about how PrEP and viral suppression are represented. Uh, especially PrEP, because if they're, my understanding is that it's an average, uh, and so it's basically an average susceptibility in that population rather than uh, a, a group is protected and a group is not protected. Yes, right. So, so the way that it works, right? So that proportion that we're giving you in time are enrolled in a PrEP program, right? And it basically, the underlying math is you say, well, the risk to that compartment, right, is, you know, full risk to the people who are not on PrEP, and then the people who are on PrEP is the proportion on PrEP times the relative risk, basically, in, in reduction, right? And, and we used, and, and so I should say, too, the data that we use, right, so we're not assuming that people are taking PrEP perfectly, just that they are, you know, in a PrEP program, right? And so we sort of use the data from the trials for people who are in a PrEP program, what are the reductions, right? So for MSM, Right, the point estimate is 86% reduction, right? So they basically are 0.14 times as likely to get HIV. Um, although, again, that's something that we vary um, from simulation to simulation. Um, am I answering your question? Yes and no, because like for me, those on PrEP have to be on their own compartment and those not on PrEP have to be on a separate compartment. But it sounds yeah. here that they're like all in the same compartment and that you're, you've averaged susceptibility. Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, mathematically, um, it works out to sort of similar, right? If you said you have this many people in a non-prep compartment, right, they're moving to infect at the rate of whatever the, the infection rate is, right? And then if you have the prep compartment, they would move at that same infection rate times 0.14, we'll say, right? And so instead, we squish them together. And, and just the reason for doing that is that then if you have two compartments, you can't actually set the proportion of prep, right? You can only say, well, we think approximately this level is here, approximately this level. But if you have them in one compartment, you can actually directly control that proportion of prep and make it be exactly 25% or exactly 30% or whatever you want. Well, I think we'd have to, I mean, if you had them in two compartments, you could also just have the exact proportion, right? Because you'd have this, this, this compartment over the, two, the sum of the two compartments. So it could also you, be you can right, but you can't actually can right if for different compartments. And again, I, maybe I'm belaboring the point much. What you can control is the rates at which people move into or out of those compartments, right? So you oh, can say yeah, I mean, you would average, have to calibrate, you, you you would have to calibrate the, to the proportion that you want to the right. coverage. Yeah, that's right. So you would have to titrate exactly, yeah, um, yeah, which yeah, ends yeah. up just being more computationally expensive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just kind of wondering about the the implications of that. Uh, you know, of that kind of like average susceptibility rather than clearly having a group that is protected versus a group that is not. Um, but I guess that that matters more if you if you're looking at mixing patterns, uh, depending on, on prep and when the model is already so complex that you cannot be looking at that and, and uh, you know you're looking at much, much larger kind of population. So uh, yeah, that, yeah, that right. Sense. So, so I think, yeah, which is right. So I mean, basically, what the limitation there is that then you, you have to make, right? It, it is mathematically the same as two compartments if you assume that those two compartments behave in the same way with respect to mixing, right? The people with PrEP are equally likely to mix with people not on PrEP, right? So you're right. With this formulation, we could not um, capture those sorts of things. Yeah, no. yeah. And my other, que my other question was uh, whether you had compared your outcomes with those of um, the group uh, Nozick. I don't know if you looked at the... Are, are they similar? I can't remember at all what they found in terms of like achieving this 90% reduction in incidence, but I thought it would be interesting to compare. Yeah, so we did. Um, well, what we did is we compared our baseline scenarios, right? And so there's, there's a number of differences between our models. Number one, that they're focused on just the counting and not the surrounding area. But 
um, we were able to compare sort of, you know, they ran, they had, they had published a set of simulations for what if, you know, after 2017, you don't change levels of prep or testing or anything at all. And so they project those forward and we project those forward too. And so I mean, we're in the neighborhood, right? I think ours were a little more optimistic for what would happen if you did nothing else, right? Maybe about, you know, five to 10% more reduction, um, but they were sort of in the neighborhood. We also, um, Jeunesse et al, they have a model, a, a network transmission model in Atlanta, right? And so again, we also were able to project sort of baseline scenarios of what if you just continue basic things and, and we're in the range. And also they published some testing scenarios and we come very close to sort of what they project for testing scenarios. So there, uh, for their be, models focused on there would seem to be an agreement uh, between all the models so far that this 90% reduction by 2030 is, is probably uh, hard to achieve, right? Yeah, right. And then the other one too, there's a national level model, right? So not a state level model. Um, and they had looked at, yeah, what if you did, they said there's something like 27% prep uptake and I forget exactly, but basically, right, they also, the national model was also saying it is hard to get to 90%. Um, what I was, uh, and it's the last thing I'm gonna say, sorry, I'm taking over, but uh, the last uh, thing I was gonna say is it'd be interesting or maybe helpful in terms of messaging to just say how long it would take to get to that 90%, just to not to be so discouraging and be like, okay, we might not get there by, you know, 2030, but if we do all these things, we'll get there by 2035 or, uh, you know, or like give the, the estimate in each of those um, counties or metropolitan statistical areas uh, for, for when they can expect to actually reach that. And my last, last thing is, uh, you're probably aware of that, but uh, Andrea Weirds and colleagues have this uh, cohort of transgender women in 70 cities across the United States. I know it doesn't give you uh, prevalence historically, but it might be at least one point to kind of calibrate for transgender women. I know yeah. it's tricky, but yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. I think a lot. Thanks so much, Anik. Um, Great questions. Lalo, I think your hand was up next. Well, I just wanted to congratulate Todd. I know how busy he is and he took the challenge and accepted the invitation and thank you Todd, that was absolutely terrific. I wanna reflect on your observation that even if we go to 90% of uh, HIV viremia suppression in San Diego on those aware, we accomplish little um to get to the goal of elimination by 2030 which brings me to the point that the UNA declaration left which is the issue is to focus on those who are not aware and left behind um because the media and some means miss a lot of the big picture among those vulnerable populations so what I wonder is um if you already did I don't know inserted specifically if you increase five to 10% of those interventions specifically, for example, thought PrEP on MSMN of color with substance use and mental illness. And similarly, a more complex category for the effect of viremia. I don't know if that will be too granular to do. Uh, and my last comment is, I was very fascinated by your COVID-19 uh, module and model. And I know you're focusing on elimination, but are you Lancet HIV by g -Web? Yeah, you know, I guess I, we had not planned it, but, but we could, right? Um, I mean, that's in there. I, I could pull them and tell them to you. I have not done so. Um, and then to your first question too, I mean, actually we are, that's, you know, in the end, this is also part of my can. What I said I would do is I would use this to look at then mental health and, and substance use, right? So that is actually also in the work, um, to sort of being able to then more granularly break out um, at risk populations. Okay, and then Nettie had a question and I was gonna have her unmute because it was long. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry, while I was uh, waiting to answer. So for, first of all, thank you so much. It was really interesting and um, a lot of thought. Uh, I, I, I couldn't resist putting a little editorial in the side there just now because, you know, there, there is green in that model, right? And then we say, well, that's just gonna be too hard. And I, I feel like, you know, COVID has shown us that if you actually put money and resources and dedication to something, we can do a lot. So it's a good time for us to start 
you know, demanding that other important infectious diseases get the um, attention and will and resources to end them. So anyway, that's a little editorial. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on how um, incident STIs affect your model or where that fits in. We're seeing this explosion of STIs right now with all these people emerging from the pandemic. They seem to still be virally suppressed, but I don't know whether the sexual communities where they were getting their STIs, whether there's gonna be a lot of incident HIV infections in there. So I couldn't remember from the beginning if you mentioned how incident STIs sort of affect your projections. So yeah, they're not in there, um, but that is actually, I think what I would like to do right, for the next step is I would like to tie them in right now. I mean, fundamentally what we'd be looking to do, right, is you use that as the clue to sort of what's going on with sexual transmission, right? Um, and, and so we'd have to, it's again, something I get very sad about, but think about like the way you mathematically tie um, transmission rates for other STIs to what you think is going on with, with HIV. Um, so it's not in there, um, but I am looking to do that to get a better sense of particularly the impact of the, the pandemic on, on transmission. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what's gonna, we have this, this big wave, I don't know others, others are seeing this, we're seeing this big wave of STIs, but we only see HIV positive patients, they seem to still be suppressed. So I don't know if the community wide STI rates are gonna be going up and then what that means for the pandemic, it's gonna be an interesting, we won't know for a while, but. Sorry, the HIV epidemic, not the COVID pandemic. Todd, I know you already uh, addressed it, excuse me. Um, there was another question about cost, but I think there's a, an interesting piece to this is, uh, so the question was, do models take into account how much funding is available? Um, and I think an interesting question, or this interesting part is how much would it cost to get to 90%? So is there a way to do that in the, you know, when you do a cost analysis, like what would it actually take to get to that place? Yeah. And I, I will also say too, you know, one of our collaborators is a costing person. I'm not a costing person, me, person. But um, but yes, I mean, you absolutely can do it, right? Sort of the model gives you all the things that you need to do that, right? To know sort of how many people are, right? The effect on the cost of, you know, and, and I will say too, for, for prior iterations of this model, um, you actually would get, I don't know, a paradoxical re result that, you know, doing like diagnosing things or doing, Diagnosing more people is actually more expensive, right? Because then you incur the cost of having them on ART, right? Having them sort of treated. But but yes, I mean, I think we, we would like to do that, right? And that's one of the things that we're looking at doing fundamentally is, right, you have sort of all these things, you know how many people are, are on ART at a given time, and you can sort of layer on what are the costs of each of these, uh, you know, of, of each of these, of the person time in each compartment, so. Does anyone else have any other questions? I, I had one question that I think, I, I feel like I know the answer to just because of the way that you were showing this, but with, in terms of prep with new modalities, you know, with cabotegravir now um, just being approved, although maybe some back steps for a couple of other um, agents with lenacapavir and Islatravir maybe, uh, not doing what we heard, you know, a little, at least a clinical pause for them. Um, and then Cabanuva in the uh, HIV world, does that factor in at all into the models or is that just sort of more coverage or different coverage? Can, yeah. can you comment on that? Yeah, so so these ones are not. We actually just submitted a manuscript actually looking at scaling uh, injectable agents. So I can tell you, you know, it, again, hasn't been reviewed, but I can tell you what we found. Um, but, but, but for this work I've done, it it would be just assuming prep coverage at sort of the efficacy um, that that oral prep is, uh, right? Um, you know, from from the from the scaling up sort of injectable stuff. And the one thing you see is you don't actually like if you were just to replace all oral prep with injectable, um, with you know, with increased efficacy, you don't get a whole lot of bang for your buck, right? I mean, fundamentally, the things that that help it is does it help you reach more people? And then does it increase persistence, right? The, the degree to which people say, right? So, so sort of the degree to which you think injectable agents do those two things really determines um, the extra bang for your buck you get in terms of prevention. Right, that makes population. sense. And I would imagine it isn't in the modeling world particularly super substantial um, with how, I mean, it'd be one thing if you could just, you know, anyone could get it and everyone wanted to do it, but we know that's gonna be very complicated and who's actually gonna get it. And, 
who's going to cover it and all those things. Um, it looks like we have another question from Anique. A mini question and probably not a very interesting one, but I, I don't remember if in your model you had any scenario where there was just increases in condom use. So sorry, uh, my internet connection went off. Can you say that again? I didn't catch it. Uh, that I was wondering if uh, any of your scenarios uh, looked at increases in condom use. Yeah, we did not. Um, I mean, we could, um, right? Because you basically model that as a change in sexual transmission, but, but we did not do that. Because I think we're basically, and I mean, I'm part of that as well, but we, we often ignore condom use and I mean, they're still around, they're really cheap, they're useful and they protect against many things at the same time. So uh, I think it's, it's worth always keeping them in and might help get to the green shade. Yeah, your point is well taken. had a comment made to that. Uh, I feel like Jeff always makes this point is that I don't see condom use increasing <laughs> over there's, time. There's a, there's a big movement against condoms. I, I went to this condom meeting at UNH like a couple of years ago, and it was this kind of desperate call for kind of like bringing back the condom onto, onto HIV prevention maps. And I don't know, like, I think there's so many clever ways now and marketing and I don't know like I, I still believe in them but yeah I, I get that for the MSM communities. Does anyone There's, call it BBC? Bring back condoms? Yeah. <laughs> Do a nice little. The problem is <laughs> that even when condoms were you know quote trendy people were just saying they used condoms or they brought the condom to the event or they took it out of the wrapper and and I'm not saying that that was it was it was you know, not well-intentioned, but that's the challenge with condoms is, you know, we talk about condoms and we know that they work and we do still provide a ton of condoms, you know, but um, I think when you're trying to study condoms or put them in a model or whatever, you know, there's really no good way to actually see what happened with the condom, whereas with viral suppression or with PrEP or other things where you actually can, you know, see prescriptions or you can see uh, viral loads or you can see drug levels or you can actually see how your intervention is working. I think condoms are always tricky um, to study, even if we should keep using them, you know, um, in, in practice. Yeah. Well, I always love to end a talk about <laughs> condoms. So I think this is a good stopping point. Um, Todd, this really was incredible. You can take a look in the chat for all of the praise um, including, including brilliant talk. So I think we, this was really was uh, really interesting and so helpful for us to see lots to ponder. Um, we'll have to have you back at some point to, to get more data and, and see where things are both from a COVID and HIV perspective. Um, so thank, well, thank you. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. You guys were probably the best audience I've had. So thank you. Oh, we love hearing that. <laughs> All right, well, and thanks Lalo for, uh, for bringing Todd to us. Uh, great, great way to start off the year. Um, let's get to the, back to the fight, everybody. Um, and, and we'll see you next week. Have a great Friday and weekend. And thanks again, Todd. Thank you all, I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.